Bless the Lord who forgives all our sins. His mercy endures forever. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you. In God, word and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors and ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly regret. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will. And walk your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you. Forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. Amen. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Gracious Father, whose blessed Son Jesus Christ came down from heaven to be the true bread which gives life to the world, evermore give us this bread that he may live in us and we in him who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. A lesson from the book of Numbers. From Mount Hor they set out by the way to the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom. But the people became impatient on the way. The people spoke against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food and no water, and we detest this miserable food. Then the Lord sent poisonous serpents among the people, and they bit the people so that many Israelites died. The people came to Moses and said, we have sinned by speaking against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord to take away these serpents from us. So Moses prayed for the people. And the Lord said to Moses, Make a poisonous serpent and set it on a pole, and everyone who is bitten shall look at it and live. So Moses made a serpent of bronze and put it on a pole. And whenever a serpent bit someone, that person would look at the serpent of bronze and live. The word of the Lord. God. Psalm 107. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. And his mercy endures forever. Let all those who the Lord has redeemed proclaim that he redeemed them from the hand of the foe. He gathered them out of the lands, from the east and from the west, from the north and from the south. Some were fools and took to rebellious ways. They were afflicted because of their sins. They abhorred all manner of food and grew near to that store. And they cried to the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them from their distress. He sent forth his word and healed them, and saved them from the grave. Let them give thanks to the Lord for his mercy, and the wonders he does for his children. Let them offer a sacrifice of thanksgiving, and tell of his acts with shouts of joy. A reading from the letter of Paul to the Ephesians. You were dead through the trespasses and sins in which you once lived, following the course of this world, following the ruler of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work among those who are disobedient. 
All of us once lived among them in the passions of our flesh, following the desires of flesh and senses, and we were by nature children of wrath, like everyone else. But God, who is rich in mercy, out of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead through our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved, and raised us up with him, and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Jesus Christ, so that in the ages to come, he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace, you have been saved through faith, and this was not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not the result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are what he has made us, created in Jesus Christ for good works, which God prepared beforehand to be our way of life. The word of the Lord. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to John. Jesus said, Just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but may have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Those who believe in him are not condemned, but those who do not believe are condemned already because they have not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment, that the light has come into the world and the people loved darkness rather than light because, of their, de because their deeds were evil. For all who do evil hate the light and do not come to the light so that their deeds may not be exposed. But those who do what is true come to the light, so that they may be clearly seen that their deeds have been done in God. The Gospel of the Lord. passages for today. Pardon me while I turn my mic over. Lectionary passages for today remind me of the tale of two gods. The God of scarcity and the God of abundance. I'm an ordained elder in the Church of the Nazarene who like, most, who like the Methodists are theological heirs of John Wesley. And Wesley, as some of you may know, was the Anglican priest who, along with his brother Charles, is largely responsible for the Methodist movement, which was an abundant. Wesley's a bit more comprehensive insofar as he understands theologically uh, that God's grace is offered to all uh, as an invitation, an invitation for all of humanity to be restored to the image of God, the natural, moral, and political image. This restoration is understood by Wesley as at once both cooperant, meaning that God respects the freedom of human agency to reject God's offer of free grace, and secondly, transformative. That is, restoration is transformative insofar as for those who choose to accept God's offer of free grace, God is faithful to restore them completely sanctifying them as full participants in God's abundant and everlasting life. Enough about my theological heritage. So here we have Moses, who, have, who is cooperatively working with God, and together they were working to liberate the Hebrew people who were enslaved by one of the gods of scarcity, Pharaoh. They had just come 
through the parting of the Red Sea a few chapters earlier. Of course, God did not remove the Red Sea, but he parted it. That is, God created a way through it. So first, God with Moses works to liberate the Hebrews out of the scarcity of bondage in Egypt, and being an abundant God ensures their safe departure through the Red Sea and out of the hands of Pharaoh for good. The end of the story, right? Not so much. Then what happens? Well, before I go on, it may be helpful to remark uh, about the relationship between Scripture and my nerdy little habit of neuroscience. Um, this, of course, is a tip not only to um, Father Chris, but also my own interests in neuroscience. And this may be an odd pairing for some, so hang with me. One of, the, one of the areas that scripture and neuroscience intersect is in the philosophical discipline of hermeneutics. And hermeneutics is a philosophical field that studies and examines the practice of interpreting texts. And scripture, as you know, is a text to be interpreted. But beyond the parchment and inked markings that constitute most texts, really a text can be anything. In fact, our bodies can be a text. The relationships that we share with one another are texts to be interpreted. Everybody with me? Okay. So neuroscience then factors in when we conceive of how the brain works in the practice of interpreting a text. Without getting too mired in the tedious notion of biology and neuronal pathways and prefrontal cortexes and all this kind of stuff, Let's look a little bit more accessibly at the way the brain functions on the whole. Here are a couple conversation partners, Mark Johnson and George Lakoff, offer some good thoughts. And that is, they, they see the way in which we interpret things uh, as embodied metaphors. We interpret things through the use of embodied metaphors. Metaphors is, is just a rhetorical device that helps to create uh, accessibility to really complex and difficult uh, subjects. And the kind of metaphors they're referring to uh, are embodied metaphors that illustrate how bodies like ours work. We have metaphors for everything. Affection, for example, is a temperature. Warmth, coldness. Bad is a smell, stinky. Important is a comparative size, big or little. Or an altitude, high. Less is a direction, down. Or another altitude, low. Even things like our mood, we often interpret a happy mood, for example, as having a direction, up. Or like a weight, as in a light mood. Then sad, of course, is the opposite direction, down. Or visually, a dark mood, and so on. Are you still with me? OK. So as we come back to Moses and the Hebrew people in the desert, it's important to note that the writer here, too, is likely, rather than merely logging the day and day activities of uh, the people in Exodus, in a literal sense, the author's likely making use of metaphor here on occasion to convey certain complex thoughts in accessible ways. What am I getting at? I want to suggest here that interpreting scripture can often be a tricky thing if we're not careful. And sometimes when we read scripture literally, the bigger and the more faithful picture can easily be overlooked. And that to grasp the bigger and more faithful picture is uh, helpful sometimes to use things like metaphors. So Moses makes it through one of the most remarkable miracles in the Bible the parting of the Red Sea. And one might think, wow, what an abundance of power God has. That's surely a good sign that the right God, the God of abundance, is with the Hebrew people, and so they can have uh, nothing to fear anymore, that they'll be just fine, and it's going to be easy to trust God, and by extension Moses, uh, that together they'll lead the Hebrew people out of the hands of Egypt and into the promised land safely and securely. But of course, that doesn't actually happen either. What happens? A God of scarcity slithered its way in and 
the people start to complain. Of course, complaining is not necessarily a bad thing. It is, however, a matter of how one complains that seems to make all the difference. My favorite preacher is an old Southern preacher by the name of Fred Craddock. Won't get many people like Fred. Um, if you have a chance to listen to Fred, he's easily accessible. Some of his old sermons on YouTube. Lovely, lovely guy. And Fred used to say, there's no frequency on earth that can make a child's whine soothing to the eardrum. <laughs> um, and I can imagine that God understood this quite well. The Hebrews started to whine. Of course, we have a few centuries now on the Hebrews. So in our contemporary setting, we can look back and sort of roll our eyes at the Hebrews, maybe, and say things like, you know, come on, you know, read the room, Hebrews. God's on your side. Quit the complaining. But let's think about this a little bit more critically through our contemporary lens. So I'll have a confession here. The confession is I don't have any snuffy stories. Um, I do think that John Brown can be a useful character, however. For those who, who know, John Brown was an abol abolitionist, and he was passionate. And some may say perhaps a little too passionate about freeing slaves. Ironically, despite the fact that Brown was passionate about freeing slaves, he believed in an underdeveloped and uncritical neuroscience, uh, the, in, the science of phrenology, which was feeling the outside of the skull to determine certain qualities of a person, uh, and which was the predecessor of what we now know as, as eugenics, which held, essentially, that some people were just simply genetically inferior to others, and this included blacks. As such, despite being a committed abolitionist, John Brown remained racist in the way in which he viewed blacks. While he was deeply compelled to free enslaved people, he himself was enslaved to the scarcity of belief that were part of the very practices that he sought to eliminate. That's not to diminish the importance of abolishing slavery, however. It is to say that sometimes the God of scarcity can appear awfully compassionate. And in the end, John Brown's efforts to free slaves led him to murder, and as a result, be captured and hung for his passion. Of course, he was seen as a villain by many in the South and a martyr by some in the North. But what is it that brings John Brown to the discussion here? Why bring him into it? Because as right and noble as ending slavery was and is, the God of scarcity didn't just lead Brown to the gallows. It revealed yet another problem. Well, Brown attempted to use some of the freed slaves to build a slave army to overtake uh, those in the South and liberate more slaves. Um, there were still other slaves, those with a scarcity of memory for anything apart from enslavement. And so m several slaves, many slaves, that Brown attempted to free simply remained on the plantation. Despite the freedom Brown offered, the god of scarcity offered for some nothing more than a cruel venom of paralysis. This was confusing for Brown. He remarked on this many times that he was puzzled by the fact that they weren't excited to be free. They simply didn't know what to do with the freedom they'd been provided. So you see, liberation from oppression, liberation from slavery, liberation from sin, it's absolutely critical. Yet, without the God of abundance to provide the hope and possibility for what liberation is for, what it means, for example, to flourish, the freedom that we're offered may be little more than a dirty trick at the hands of a cruel God, a God of scarcity. Similarly, even though God had liberated the Hebrews from slavery in Egypt and fed them along the way, challenges remained. Because the God of scarcity had held the Hebrews for so long, they were easily given to doubt you know, with good reason. It's entirely understandable that they would have questioned God and his abundance. 
um, for fear that God was tricking them, bringing them out into the desert to destroy them. They were tired of walking. They were tired of the food. They were irritable. At times they were confused. They were frustrated and likely in need of a really nice nap. So what's next? What happens next? The, the serpents get loose, right? Here come the, serpent, the poisonous serpents with their Make Egypt Great Again hats and their Build Back Babel banners and t-shirts. I'm sure that uh, there was even a Charles Ponzi and a Bernie Madoff or two in the mix. Politicians and grifters, snake oil salesmen, they often show up like snakes and they worship at the feet of the god of scarcity. And out they came. The serpents having seized on the opportunity to try and catch as catch can. And many of the Hebrews end up getting bit. Some of them even died. But God didn't abandon them. Rather, God offers a solution. And unlike the God of scarcity, unlike the God of fear, the God of abundance has an abundant imagination. And so God sets out to redefine the image of a serpent. He tells Moses to make the image of a serpent out of bronze and set it on a pole, top of the, the pole. Why a serpent? Why bronze? People tend to pay attention to those things that they're often frightened by, don't they? I can imagine God telling my parents to make a bronze image out of the scary clown doll that sat in my sister's room as a kid so that I could you know, sit still in church or something. And so here, God illustrates just how abundant God is, transforming something that once provoked fear and paralysis into something that brings healing and mobility. God turns the serpent into a symbol of health. Similarly, bronze is not a symbol of wealth like gold, but more practical, useful building material and a common metal. It's representative of natural goodness and truthfulness. And so if anyone were to get bit by a serpent of scarcity, yet look up on it. Look at the image of hope, of enduring abundance and restoration. They would survive as long as they looked up on it. So here we are in the season of Lent. And once again, we're reminded of the God of scarcity. When we fast, we're reminded of how tempting it is to look for relief from the suffering that some of us may experience. Sometimes we tend to reach out or can reach out to the God of scarcity by way of panic and suddenly find ourselves paralyzed. Of course, this is especially and exponentially true during a pandemic. When scarcity of toilet paper, of water, of income, for some electricity, and other similar necessities, when those things become a, a critical concern. And let's be honest, it's entirely reasonable. It's reasonable to panic. Finding new and innovative ways to survive through a pandemic, through enslavement, through the barrenness of the desert, it's not easy. It's absolutely reasonable to doubt to be anxious, to be afraid, to be down, to feel lost. It's easy and reasonable to question the motives, the efforts of others, to wonder, is this really as good as it gets? But if this is all that Lent's about, being reasonable, if this is really where the story ends, reminding us of the God of scarcity, that life is often hard, often difficult. If that's really all that there is, perhaps Lent, too, has become like the poisonous serpent. What other option is there, aside from scarcity? If there's more to life than merely survival, merely catch as catch can, what do we do? Where is the God of abundance when we get bit? Just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, 
so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but may have eternal life. Indeed, God did not come into the world, God did not send his son to the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. When we're low, when we're down, When the snake of scarcity slithers all around, what image comes to mind? Where is the abundance of hope that we seek to find? Maybe, just maybe, we look up. Let us affirm our faith by saying together, we believe in one God, the Father. Let us pray. I ask your prayers for God's people throughout the world, for our presiding Bishop Michael, our Bishop-elect Paula, for this gathering, and for all ministers and people. Pray for the church. I ask your prayers for peace, for goodwill among nations, and for the well-being of all people. Pray for justice and peace, remembering especially all who serve in the armed forces and their family. I ask your prayers for the poor, the sick, the hungry, the oppressed, and those in prison. Pray for those in any need or trouble. I ask your prayers for all who seek God or a deeper knowledge of God. Pray that they may find and be found by God. I ask your prayers for the departed, especially for Nancy and Robert in our parish cycle of prayer, for Jean Yentz, the mother of Jill Delaney, for Dana, sister-in-law, of the Abrams, and for Kristen Miller, who died on Wednesday. Pray for those who have died. Ask your thanksgivings for all the blessings with which God enlivens our lives, 
Today we give special thanks for the birthdays of Bill and Ethan and for all other blessings. I ask your prayers for those on our parish prayer list. Mary, Elizabeth, Clara. We pray for David, Don, and Patty. For Margot, Casey, Christopher, Robin, Nick. Donna, Dylan. Earl, Arden. We pray for Bill, Linda, Susie. Sam, Anne, Barb. For Marty, Cindy, John, Annabelle, Frank, Marilyn, Andrew, Susan, Maureen, Louise, Vince, Gretchen, Aaron, Betsy, Megan, Bill, Jill. We pray for Jim, Hal, John, Bruce, Harriet, Roger, Marilyn, Peggy. I ask your gratitude for the ministry of Breakthrough, one of the care and compassion ministries this parish supports. Praise God for those in every generation in whom Christ has been honored. Pray that we may have grace to glorify Christ in our own day. Amen. The peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you. Blessing and grace be with all on this beautiful fourth Sunday of our holy season. And let not only those of you here present, but also those who are worshiping with us remotely. I uh, wanted to mention that we are apparently successfully using our new system for the first time. So hopefully uh, both the video and audio are better at home. Um, so if you happen to be watching at home, worshiping with us, I hope that you're able to hear and see us well. Uh, but blessings to all on this holy day. We have, as always, uh, a richness of offerings and opportunities for growth and nourishment in the days and weeks ahead. I won't recount them all, but you're all aware of the morning prayer that's taking place on Mondays and Fridays, the evening prayer on Wednesdays, the Eucharist during the week. A reminder that, of course, on Thursday night we'll have the last in our Lenten series in the wilderness at 7 o'clock. The title this week is Leaving the Wilderness. Uh, so even if you haven't joined us before, please feel free to join us this Thursday at 7. Wanted to mention as well that next Sunday we have actually two special events. The first is that Carter will be concluding his three-part series on the letter to the Romans right after the 915 Eucharist. And so if you are here, please stay and join in. If you're worshiping remotely, please come back for that third session. But then also that afternoon, next Sunday the 21st at 4 o'clock, we're going to have the special musical offering to celebrate the birthday of J.S. Bach. We normally would be doing a Lenten even song. We can't do that, of course, right now. So Derek and some other professional musicians are going to be offering this special offering at 4 o'clock. Derek will play some of the great organ works by Bach. We'll have the Double Violin Concerto in D minor. We'll have a couple of arias from uh, professional singers from our choir. That will be both in person and streamed. So if you'd like to hear it live, in person, please come. If you'd like to participate virtually, it will also be streamed next Sunday, 4 o'clock. In the bulletin today, there is a very truncated uh, uh, schedule for the Holy Week and Easter liturgies. Not everything is included. The most critical days, let's say, are. But I wanted to highlight that on Palm Sunday and Easter Day, we'll have three services, not just two, three at 7.30, 9.15, and 11.15.
For the 915 liturgies on those two days, we are asking that you go to the parish website, holycomforter.org. At the very top, there is a banner where you can click and sign up for the 915 Palm Sunday and or Easter day. Sadly, we have to limit attendance here in the church. We'll have overflow in the parlor and then also in the great room, so which, uh, where the service will be streamed. It's not the same, we realize, but it's the best we can do. Uh, so please, if you're worshiping afar or if you're here, um, it'd be sort of a race maybe to get to that website today to sign up for one of those uh, different slots. We apologize, but this is... Uh, as I say, we're trying to make it available, these liturgies, to as many people as we can, even as we have to adjust so many other details. Finally, wanted to uh, thank our preacher today. I know that some of you... <laughs> some of you know Brandon, some of you may not. Uh, Brandon and his family have been members here at Holy Comforter for just a little under four years, and as he mentioned, he is uh, both... Uh, an elder in the Church of Nazarene, but also a licensed marriage and family therapist getting his PhD. Uh, and it's been a, a, a joy to have them be part of our family and a privilege this morning to have Brandon come and preach. And thank you so much for doing this. Ascribe to the Lord the honor due his name. Bring offerings and come into his courts with praise and thanksgiving. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give God thanks and praise. It is right, and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you. Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, you bid your faithful people cleanse their hearts and prepare with joy for the Paschal Feast that fervent in prayer and in works of mercy, and renewed by your word and sacraments, they may come to the fullness of grace which you have prepared for those who love you. Therefore we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. We give thanks to you, O God, for the goodness and love which you have made known to us in creation, in the calling of Israel to be your people, in your words spoken to the prophets, and above all, 
in the Word made flesh, Jesus, your Son. For in these last days you sent him to be incarnate from the Virgin Mary, to be the Savior and Redeemer of the world. In him you have delivered us out of evil and made us worthy to stand before you. In him you have brought us out of error into truth, out of sin into righteousness, out of death into life. On the night before he died for us, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread. And when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took a cup of wine. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for all for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, according to his command, O Father, we remember his death, we proclaim his resurrection, we await his coming in glory. And we offer our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving to you, O Lord of all, presenting to you from your creation this bread and this wine. We pray, your gracious God, to send your Holy Spirit upon these gifts, that they may be the sacrament of the body of Christ and his blood of the new covenant. Unite us to your Son in his sacrifice, that we may be acceptable through him, being sanctified by the Holy Spirit. In the fullness of time, put all things in subjection under your Christ, and bring us to that heavenly country where, with the blessed Virgin Mary, blessed Joseph, blessed Nicodemus, and all your saints, we may enter the everlasting heritage of your sons and daughters. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, the firstborn of all creation, the head of the church, and the author of our salvation. By him, and with him, and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Amen. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world. Have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Have mercy on us. O Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Grant us peace. And now joining with those worshiping virtually, my loving Lord, I believe that you are truly present in the blessed sacrament of the altar. I cherish you above all things and long for you in my soul. Since I cannot receive you in the sacrament of your body and blood, come spiritually into my heart. Cleanse and strengthen me with your grace, Lord Jesus, and let me never be separated from you. May I live in you and you in me in this life and in the life to come. Amen. The gifts of God for the people of God.
Let us pray. Father in heaven, whose church on earth is a sign of your heavenly peace, an image of the new and eternal Jerusalem, grant to us in the days of our pilgrimage that fed spiritually with the living bread of heaven and united in the body of your Son, we may be the temple of your presence, the place of your glory on earth, and a sign of your peace in the world. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Look down in mercy, Lord, on your people before you, and grant that those whom you have nourished by your word and sacraments may bring forth fruit worthy of repentance. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.